All right, so I'm from Indonesia, but I grew up in Singapore, and I just wanted to say thank you for having me in the Philippines. This is my first time, and I'm really enjoying myself. So as you know, the U.S. is a new president. Now, many Americans think that he's going to bring jobs back to the Americans, but little do they know that robots like Pepper here won't let him. And in fact, this was just the headlines news on TechCrunch just three days ago. Now, Pepper has a little friend called Baxter, and robots like these are increasingly taking over the world. From making pizzas, to taking orders behind the counters, to being flight attendants who would never consider grumbling about picking up too much trash. According to the World Economic Forum, robots are replacing as many as 5 million jobs by the year 2020. These jobs include jobs from the service industry, to the retail and shoe garment manufacturing industry, many of which are based in developing countries like Indonesia and the Philippines. Now, you may think, great, now I can go on vacation and let a robot answer my emails for me. Or you might be one of those people who would be frantically and fervently Googling, or like, will a robot be taking over my job? Whatever the case, I think one thing is for sure. It is undeniable the impact and role of technology has in our lives today. Nor can we afford, like President Trump, to not be able to write emails or use a cell phone. We are living in what some call a fourth industrial revolution, and some people actually call this the automation revolution. I think these revolutions are going to be happening sooner and more fast-paced than we think. So I co-founded a school in 2012. The intent was initially to teach some kids how to code. Why code, you may ask? My usual answer is, why not? Well, schools have always been historically tasked to teach kids how to be job ready. Well, given that the 21st century is so fast paced, what can we actually do for our children so that they will be job ready in the future? Some parents I met and spoke to expressed all sorts of concerns. They're like, what if my child gets addicted to the computer? Or like, why can't you let kids be kids? Or, you know, let them run outside, play with the dirt, catch some butterflies. Essentially, I think what they're really afraid of is, will this child be a nerd? Now, hands up all of you self-identified nerds out there. All right. <laughs> so I usually tell them, no, because if your child is a nerd, that's a great thing. Your little Susie will fall in love with what she can do with computers. And if she becomes addicted, please call me when that happens, because she would essentially be spending her time behind the computer thinking about what she can do and what she can do with a game when she's playing it. Now, isn't that a great thing? People who have never coded before think that it's difficult. They think that it's impossible for kids to pick it up. So most parents' emails usually start with some form of guilt, some form of shame, and some form of self-aggrandizing, my child is a genius. They usually say, I don't know what technology is. My kid is better with tech than me. You know, she learned how to use the iPad, and like, I didn't even have to teach her how to do that. Well, if there are any of you such parents out there, with all due respect, I'm sorry to have to break your bubble. Um, your little Susie isn't the genius here. It is actually the ones at Apple who made the user interaction super friendly. So their two-year-old knows how to work the iPad just by jabbing her little fingers around. <laughs> now, let's start with what we understand with digital literacy. Digital literacy, as Mozilla say, is as important as reading, writing, and arithmetic. So while using an iPad is only one side of the word, they know how to read, and they know how to use it. When we talk about literacy, it usually refers to something like a language. To be literate in something basically means to be able to read and write, and to be able to use that language as a system of meanings that another person can understand. It's also the same idea of being fluent in a language. Mozilla has even outlined an even more comprehensive and rigorous understanding of what they mean by digital literacy. It comprises of things such as problem solving, which includes being able to navigate, compose, revise, evalu evaluate, and synthesize. Other parts are equally as important, and I stress here, as important as things such as being able to communicate that and to be able to use those skills creatively and collaboratively. 
Fundamentally, there is a polar distinction between consuming media and producing media. At Saturday Kids, we took a working definition of the creatives of Scratch, which, as you can see here, it is an open source programming language developed by the MIT Media Lab. Professor Mitch Resnick and his amazing team at the lab mean, defines digital literacy as being able to design, create, and remix, not just a simple matter of browsing, chatting, or interacting. Now, here comes the really fun part. What is Scratch? Well, here is a project that's created by then eight-year-old boy from Philippines called Nigel. His Scratch username is Tuasika. When I first met Nigel, he was completely silent for the first five classes. This project here called Ch Chicken Chopper exists online on Scratch MIT, where kids like Nigel and many adults in places such as Indonesia, Singapore, Africa, and the US, as many as 150 countries, form an open source community where they design and create and share projects. These can be animations, games, interactive music, stories, and some even call Scratch the interactive YouTube of digital media. What these scratches do is that they drag and drop programming languages, sorry, programming blocks like what you see on the right side to form scripts. Now, when we say that coding is a set of language, what we're actually teaching kids is that it's simply a series of instructions that you give the computer so that it can follow. And if there's anything that the computer does better than any human beings in this room or even in this planet, it's to follow instructions. And like YouTube, Scratchers personalize their projects and inject their own sense of humor and contemporary relevance. This project right here was made by an 11-year-old Jonathan with Barack Obama in a crown and Dogie the dog. And as you can see, kids just aren't kids these days. What I love about teaching kids how to code is that it gives kids the opportunity and tools to express themselves and their wonderful, wacky, absurd ideas. When you give someone an opportunity to discover who they are, you realize that kids can achieve a level of creative confidence enough to be able to say, I'm an animator and I'm a game maker. At the end of the day, this is what really makes me happy. And you know, contrary to what parents think, kids don't just become nerds. They become a herd of nerds. They collaborate <laughs> together. <laughs> to work on projects and to share and discuss ideas on what they can do better and do more meaningfully. At the end of the day, you wonder, what is creativity? Well, the most commonly held definition is that it's the production of something novel and useful. Let's break down that into three parts. The first is, you have to actually make something. The second is, that thing usually has to be kind of different and novel than a thing that already exists. And the third is that it's got to solve a problem. And the better it does that, the more creative it is rated. Now, we often say that kids are creative. What that means is that kids probably experience a sense of freedom in making something. Why is that so? Well, maybe because they aren't so aware of being judged. Because they don't feel that sense of shame that Rika so fluently talked about. Bec but the problem is that they don't create as many finished products. And if you look at the things they make, they are mostly quite similar. And usually, this is a product of what adults have told them to do. And things are really more useful than fridge decorations. But as kids grow up, they tend to be more selective in what they choose to create. They choose to create more functional things. And as they get even older, their creations tend to be more unique. But it's not just because that it's not useful to us adults doesn't mean that it's not meaningful to them. And just because it's not useful to us adults doesn't mean it's not useful forever. Now, part of what makes our brains unique is our ability to process language and stories. Stories are what made it possible for us to retain knowledge and wisdom of how to start a fire, or how to hunt for food. With kids, we don't throw them a problem and expect them to solve it. But if we don't expect them to understand real life problems, when will that ever happen? So at Saturday Kids, what we try to do is to contextualize the problems for them as stories 
and ask them to become storytellers of their own inventions. So our roles as teachers is not just to impart the knowledge or wisdom. Our roles is to set the context, to provide them with the tools and to inspire them of what's possible, show them what's been done and what technology is capable of doing. Some of you might have seen this little invention here made by a Dutch artist and engineer called Fero Jensen. Hands up, those of you who have seen this. Okay, so let me just tell you a little bit about this amazing little kinetic sculpture. In life size, it is about five meters tall. It roams the lands, and it, every time, and it's propelled by wind. And every time it touches water, it kind of scuttles away like a little spider. And the most amazing thing about this is that it's a kinetic sculpture that's not powered by anything that's battery made. So right here, our 3D printing teacher, Lionel, who's an industrial designer in real life and has invented things for Hasbro, like the Nerf gun, he actually showed a little child how this thing actually works. And guess what? This is actually made with a 3D printer. The other thing that we try to do in our classes is to use design thinking. Now, you may ask, what is design thinking? Well, simply put, it is a process that puts the needs of the users first and lets us discover and innovate solutions that are meaningful. We start by listening to the users, by empathizing with them, and then we define a problem, we prototype something, we iterate that, and then we test it and we iterate it again. Now, we use it in our core principle to teach kids how to invent with technology. Why is that so? Because if we don't invent for people, who do we invent for? Now, these inventions range from physical things, like an electronic glove, or like a coach made with LEDs, or like 3 d model objects, or stop-motion animations, or graphic designs made with vector software. Now, remember, these are kids as, far, as young as five years old. You may think that they may not be able to make sense of what they're doing, but most of the time, when we let kids contextualize their inventions, we let them tell us their stories, and they use the technology to express that. And sometimes, they take part in the stories, and we create a half-fictional, half-real world with them. So in one of our earlier design thinking classes, the kids were given a scenario where we tell them aliens are coming to invade Earth. The catch here is that we don't know if the aliens are hostile or friendly. What we do know is that they are coming to Saturdayville. They're inventing, and they are asking one of our CTO how does he actually want to help to save the Saturdayville people. He acts as a resident of Saturdayville. Now, what we do here is to create a scenario where the stakes are real and the kids love that they need to solve and help somebody. And in this picture here, one of our teachers came into class with his hands wrapped in bandage. And of course, in real life, he wasn't hurt. But in this class, he hurt his hand by while doing housework. And the kids ask him questions on how he got hurt. After empathizing and listening to their users, the kids actually map out the possible reasons. And we do that collaboratively because people are unique and people see different problems in different scenarios. We pin up what we think is the cause, either as post-its, classifying them as who, what, why, where, when. And in some cases, we actually use a body map. In another scenario, in one of our earlier design thinking classes for Google, we painted a really sad story of a grandmother who lives alone on the 11th floor with her dog. Now, she doesn't speak English, doesn't have a job, doesn't know how to use technology, and to make it even sadder, we told the kids that the lift only goes up to the 10th floor. So the kids put on their thinking caps, and depending on what they think is a problem, came up with different solutions. A few focus on our problems with mobility. One child came up with this idea of a wheelchair that can climb stairs with extendable wheels. Another thought is a better idea to make her dog like a little robot reindeer of sorts. Wouldn't it be great if dogs can walk like humans instead? Now, this one thought it would be great if grandma could wear skates that could make her fly. And guess what? It's so reasonably priced at five cents. <laughs> Now, other people focus more on her ability to feed herself. So one little girl invented a food cannon. Who needs delivery drones when you have food cannons? 
And of course, there are always the more creative, pragmatic ones. The ones who want grandmother to marry a strange man in a hat so she can take all his money and use it for herself. And the ones who are more independent who all just want to invent a money-making robot that can print money. You ask me why I love my job? This is, <laughs> this is why I love it. So kids these days. So if you remember the story where a teacher came into class injured, a seven-year-old Toko made a little massager and she made it in the shape of a comfortable doll so the person could hug it and feel cozy. And after every prototype, we invite the kids to test their inventions on their friends. Sometimes, reality isn't about what it can be used for, but who actually uses it. I want to share with you this little boombox made by three little sisters. Well, they made this boombox and they attached little electronic bits inside so that you could actually do a little turntable and both spin tables actually work. And what we invited them to do was to come down to make a fair earlier this year to talk about their little invention. Now, you know how inspiring it is when you create something and someone actually uses it? Well, we invited them and lots of people actually used it. Lastly, I want to show you this incredible machine made by a boy called Xavier. Now, Xavier saw his mother taking money out of an ATM. And then, of course, his mother was annoyed at first, thinking like, what is this pesky little child doing, such a nosy little parker, checking how much balance I have in my account? Well, guess what? Xavier went back home and he took out his Lego bricks, and he took out his Lego We Do Robotics, and within an hour, he assembled this little thing, which he called an X-Machine. Now, what the X-Machine does is that it, he programmed a little game to go with it, so that in Scratch, when you actually win a point or lose a point, the ticket dispensing machine would create a little movement that he saw from the ATM machine and he re replicated that mechanism in the exact same thing with Lego bricks. Now, what's so amazing about this story is that his mom actually showed this picture and a video of Xavier teaching a whole workshop at Maker Fair this year to his teachers in school. Now, his teachers were like, I didn't know Xavier could do that. They were so surprised. They said, wow, I didn't know Xavier had this little role perfect in him. Because you see, Xavier was a nerd, and like most nerds, they're a little bit introverted, a little bit shy to share about what they can do. And the amazing thing was that after the teacher saw this, she invited him to share with the class. And you see, being nerds can be a superpower too. I like to think that's what we do at Saturday Kids, to give kids the stage, to give them the tools to be able to share their opinions and to share their voices with the world. And sometimes it takes the form of a ticket dispensing machine that you can play a game and it can give you some form of a reward. Other times, it could be an awesome website like this. <laughs> At the end of the day, I would like to say that technology is a tool for us to express our voices and for us to change the world. Each of us is so unique and so creative. And if only if we believe in ourselves, what we can do. I want to share with you our best change maker. She is a teacher at Saturday Kids. And when I met her in 2013, she is a single mom who told me, you know, I don't know anything about technology. All I know is how to design code. But all I know is how to say something complex, and I know how to talk to kids. And fundamentally, when we create something, what we want to do is to be able to share that story with other people and to touch their lives. On the one hand, we have an alarming rate at which teachers are feeling burnt out all over the world. We think, I don't know how to teach. Who am I to teach? I'm more than qualified to stand up here on the stage. But at the end of the day, if you look around you, there are people waiting to be inspired by your stories. Each of us has a creative, unique voice that's waiting to be shared. And I want to say to all of you in this room that all of you have that voice in you, and I want you to inspire the people who you meet, just because you can and just because you have it inside you. Thank you, everyone.